Okay. Um, okay, and then I'll just let um, people come in as, as they come. Um, so welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Jessica. Yes, sorry, I am in charge of our detour program at Memorial Gallery. Um, and essentially what a detour is, is it's a quirky theme tour where we pair works of art with things that aren't always directly related to works of art. Um, so last week we did a detour where we talked about fashion and we looked at um, you know, garments in paintings and then compared them to what people are wearing today and how that's changed. Um, we've done Harry Potter in art, Game of Thrones in art. Um, we did yoga in art with our friend T and actually we're joined by T again. Um, T, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure thing. Thanks, Jessica. Hi, everyone. Um, glad to be welcomed back for another detour. And um, a little bit about myself. I'm a yoga instructor. I also teach Pilates. And ever since I can remember, I've been interested in anything that can provide health and longevity and allow people to experience optimal health. So I was super psyched to coordinate with Memorial Art Gallery to bring you this presentation of the Art of Breath. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, and we are also joined by the lovely Lauren Tayala Ferro, who works at Matthew Curatorial Department, um, and along with Ian, who wants to be a millionaire and having a very popular podcast. Um, Lauren, please tell us a little bit more about yourself. Hi everybody, I'm Lauren Tagliaferro, which is um, how they say my last name in, in Western New York. Uh, I'm a curatorial assistant here at the Memorial Art Gallery. Um, and uh, yeah, I was on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. I do have a podcast called Misinformation, a trivia podcast. It's available on iTunes. Uh, and my experience with yoga has been, um, I've dabbled in yoga on and off uh, since probably high school. And uh, I really enjoy yoga because it is the one workout where you can take a nap at the end. So, and it's encouraged. It's encouraged to take a nap at the end. So um, I'm really excited to be uh, talking about art and talking about breathing today. <laughs> Wonderful, and really quickly before we get started, um, again, sorry, my audio is a little weird. Um, I'm trying to speak as closely to the microphone as possible. Um, oh, so we are recording this session. So if you are uncomfortable being recorded, just make sure that you turn off the camera function at the bottom. Um, if you have any questions at all at any point, feel free to use the chat feature. Um, and please make sure that you are on mute. Um, so as we mentioned today, we're going to be talking about the art of breath, uh, different breathing exercises to help prevent stress. Um, so we're gonna do a quick um, icebreaker. So using the chat function, why don't you just let everyone know um, a time that you could have used a breathing stress relief tutorial. Um, you can just enter that in right now. Um, mine is right now because I'm having audio problems during a live virtual event. Feel free to share basically like any day in 2020 since March, I feel like. Um, okay, wonderful. So we're just gonna get started. I'm going to, yeah, daily. <laughs> right, working from home is so stressful. Yeah, it's true. That's why thankfully T is here to help us. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. Do, 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 do. And T is going to tell us a little bit about the history of all of the things. Is this working? Oh, sorry, it's loading. Mm. <laughs> okay, <laughs> take it away, Keith. Yes, beautiful. So some of you may be aware of what the chakra system is, but for those of you who are not aware, the word chakra means wheel in Sanskrit. And these wheels or these energy centers are actually along our spine. And we start with the red one. We're gonna be talking about that in a minute. And that starts at our root chakra. And then we work our way up to the crown chakra. And essentially these energy wheels are there to allow our energy to flow upward. And we can do certain things, certain breathing techniques or certain yoga exercises that will allow us to, to free up this energy and make sure that we have you know, optimal energy. Um, so that's why this chakra system is so interesting to learn about. And each one is associated with a different color, a different vibration, a different sound. So today is just a taste, kind of an intro into the chakra world. And I encourage you to look up more information on it afterwards, but certainly this is just a taste. So we're gonna be going through some different breathing exercises. So just a quick note on that. When you go through the breathing exercises I'm gonna give you today, I'll encourage you to take a nice upright posture and to be seated comfortably. So if you're laying down some of the breathing techniques that we're gonna be doing, 
won't necessarily, you won't receive all the benefits. So if you're upright and you have that nice posture, you're gonna receive all the benefits from the breath work we're gonna be doing today. Um, a point of caution, if you do have uh, high blood pressure or vertigo, you'll wanna make sure that you uh, stay seated. And if you start to feel some uh, symptoms of lightheadedness, that you make sure you're, you're safe and you feel that you can um, just come back to your normal breath. And so you don't feel those symptoms anymore. And then I also want you to just take notice of uh, the power of respiration today. So breathing is something that we do every three seconds, but we're gonna take notice of the type of breathing that we're doing and how that can either influence our mood and either calm us down or energize us. So thank you very much for joining. We'll get started. Wonderful, we are going to get started with red. So our red piece of artwork, the red root chakra is associated with the earth element. And our root chakra is based at the tail of the spine uh, or where your tail would be if we had one. And it's also associated with feelings of groundedness, with safety, with feelings of security and our physical existence, kind of that primordial physical existence. So the breath that we have paired with this color red that we're going to be practicing is called the trauma breath or the three part breath. And so if you're participating in the breath work, I'll just encourage you to place your hand on your chest and also one hand on your belly. And this three part breath, we're gonna inhale. And as you inhale through your nostrils, you're gonna to try to expand the upper chest then you're gonna continue your inhale through your heart and then continue that inhale down through your belly. So it's almost like a, you're taking little sips of breath through the chest, through the heart area, and then through the belly. And then you're gonna exhale it out, belly, heart, chest. So we'll practice it together and we're gonna go through and do it three times, three cycles of this breath. So you can just simply place one hand on your chest, one hand on your belly. As you inhale through the nostrils, we're gonna expand our upper chest, middle chest, then your belly. Then go ahead and exhale, belly, heart, chest. We'll do that two more times. Inhale at the top, heart and belly. Exhale it out, belly, heart, chest. One more time. Inhale, chest, heart, belly, and exhale out, belly, heart, chest. You can continue breathing and taking those little sips of breath in this kind of waterfall pattern. We're going to hear more about this red piece of artwork from Lauren. Thanks, Timmy. Um, so this is a detail of a painting by Ed Reinhardt called Abstract Painting Red. It's from 1952. And Ed Reinhardt took kind of a philosophical point of view when it came to making fine art. And um, one of the things that he really focused on was this use of color. So uh, as you can see in this detail, it's not just a solid piece of red artwork. There are different layers of red. There are different um, shades of red. And so this was supposed to be a kind of immersive artwork that you could really kind of enter the space and be surrounded by this color. Um, and one of Reinhardt's philosophies basically was that art is art and life is life. And art can't teach you about anything other than just art. It's purity and it's um, evocativeness is it in and of itself. And so you shouldn't compare it to anything else. Um, art can't teach you about life, but art can teach you about itself. And this piece is one of our favorites. It's really, really beautiful, especially seeing it up close. You see all of these very thin, very rich tones of red as you get closer to the painting. Um, one of my favorite things about this work of art is that every time I'm at MAG giving a tour, someone always says, like, why is this in a museum? I, I could have done this. Um, and it's true, you could have done this, but you didn't. Exactly. So that's what's important to remember. This was like a totally new way of thinking about art and color. Um, it's not one of my favorites, but um, you know, I get it. It's cool because from far away, it looks like it's just one 
giant rectangle of red. And then as you get closer, you see that it's actually like several different colors. Um, so that's kind of fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Moving on to orange. Okay, orange. The color orange brings us up to our second chakra. This chakra is located uh, just below the navel, halfway between the pubic bone and the navel. So in that region. And the color orange in our second chakra is associated with the water element. And this one is associated, associated also with feelings of emotion, our connection to others, our creativity and our passion. So the breath that we paired with this one is called uh, Nadi Shohana. And Nadis are energy channels in our body that help activate our chakras. And what it is, is an alternate nostril breathing. Um, so we're actually gonna plug one nostril and then open another nostril while we breathe in and out. So if everyone, if you're participating in this breath, you can make this little hang loose symbol. And this hang loose symbol, I've got a thumb out and a pinky out. And first off, you'll just wanna make sure that maybe if you have a Kleenex, you can kind of clean out your nose to start, to start with. And then you're gonna take a nice inhale in, a nice exhale out. And then with your thumb, you're gonna take a nice inhale in, then you're gonna plug your right nostril, then you're gonna exhale that breath out through the left nostril. Then you're gonna inhale through the left nostril, plug the left nostril, exhale from the right nostril. We're gonna do that again, two more cycles. Inhale the right nostril. You're gonna plug the right nostril, exhale through the left. And then send it back, inhale left. Plug that left nostril, exhale right. One more cycle, inhale right. Plug the right, exhale left and send it back, inhale left, plug the left, exhale right. Just let your hands return to your lap, let the breath return to normal. We did three full cycles. Usually this is performed in either three, five or seven cycles at a time. And you may find that if one of your nostrils was perhaps clogged before doing that little exercise, that maybe it's been freed up. And that's a testament to how you're freeing up this space internally to provide that nice flow of energy. So we're gonna hear a little bit more about this color orange and feel free to do one more set or cycle of three. So uh, this is a depiction of a female polo player, uh, from an unknown Chinese artist from the Tang Dynasty, which was the eighth century. Um, it, this, I really like this piece because the, uh, the horse is kind of chubby. Uh, he's got a big belly and uh, I think it's just very, very cute. But um, this depiction of a woman on the back of a horse uh, indicates how women enjoyed many more freedoms in the Tang Dynasty, uh, participate in sport and ride horses and ride astride like both legs across the horse. Um, wearing Western style clothing pants with a fitted jacket. Um, among the Tang elite must have played polo on a regular basis. And so they were depicted not only in ceramic sculptures like this one, but also on bronze mirrors of the period. Um, and you can, note, you can see in these bronze mirrors that they have these long hooked polo sticks. And that's how you can indicate that they were female polo players. Um, the color of this is terracotta. It's a terracotta vessel. Um, terracotta, the material was often used in China and throughout Asia for sculptures, vessels, and pottery. And um, terracotta is made from clay and it gets its color from the iron content, which reacts with oxygen during the firing process. Um, Lauren, I had a question about the pants. So I know uh, the Tang Dynasty was really advanced in their art and obviously, you know, women were allowed to ride a horse normally instead of riding with their like side saddle. Mm -hmm. um, so did they have like special pants for women, women wearing men's pants? And also like were pants restricted to polo playing? Um, women would have had their own clothing, so um, especially elite wouldn't have borrowed any clothes from, you know, their fathers or husbands or brothers or whatever. Um, they would have had their own clothing and they would have had it um, decorated in a, in a particular style. Uh, color and embroidery and beading was very uh, hierarchical at this time, so depending on her status, her clothing would have reflected that. Um, in terms of uh, if they wore it other than, I think they only wore these pants 
when riding horses. I think this was specific, like jodhpurs, like it would be specific to riding. They wouldn't be just like wearing it around town kind of thing. So um, yeah, I think it was a specifically horse riding equestrian style clothing. Yeah. That makes sense. Thank you so much. I also love the horse because yeah. I feel like you don't really see a lot of, um, you know, salubrious maybe horses in works of art. Usually the horses that you see in works of art are always like purebred and like tip top shape. Yeah. I um, like how chubby he is. I also love like, this is a very Chinese sculpture kind of quality, but um, that arc in the neck is just super beautiful. It's just my big fan. Yeah. Um, okay. Moving on to yellow. Okay, this beautiful golden yellow brings us to our third chakra. So the third chakra can be, find, can be found at the solar plexus behind the navel. So this chakra is associated with the fire element, and it's also associated with traits of your will, your power, your confidence. So the saying, when someone says, I can feel it in my gut, uh, this is the chakra that's associated with that that feeling, that feeling of confidence, that feeling of willpower. So the breath that we're gonna pair with this, since it is the fire element, and it's what boosts our confidence, is something called the Kapalabhati breath, or the breath of fire. So Kapalabhati, with a K, and the breath of fire, this is an energizing breath. So again, if you are prone to uh, dizziness or lightheadedness, uh, just make sure you're seated and uh, you can just try a couple cycles of this breath. And if you find that you're getting dizzy or lightheaded, you can return to your normal breath. So in order to practice the breath of fire, we're gonna pretend that we have a whole bunch of little tiny bugs in front of our nose. And if you were to inhale through your nostrils, those bugs would go right up your nose and that's not what we want. So we just wanna exhale through our nostrils. So after you exhale, you will get a little bit of breath in through the nostrils, but the primary goal of this breath is to exhale forcefully out through the nostrils. So I'll demonstrate quickly what this looks like or what this sounds like. So I'm gonna take a nice breath in through the nostrils and then I'm gonna exhale into seven quick, short exhales out through my nose. So I'm inhaling. So it's a very, quick exhale through the nose. And we do cycles of seven and we're gonna do three cycles of seven. So it's gonna be an inhale and then exhale forcefully seven times, then an inhale, exhale forcefully seven times. And then we'll do that one last time for the third round. Uh, you may find that as you're exhaling forcefully, you can feel your navel coming in towards your spine. So you, the diaphragm here acts like a bellows and it forces the breath in and out. So it actually helps you force it in and out. So you may feel this little kind of firing up behind the navel. So that's kind of a natural thing that occurs when we do the breath of fire. Okay, so when you're ready, you're gonna inhale through the nostrils, keep the lips closed the whole time. Exhale seven times through the nostrils quickly. Inhale. Exhale again seven times. One more time, inhale. And exhale. Let the breath return to normal. And we're gonna hear more about this beautiful color yellow from Lauren. Uh, this piece is called Fishing Well by Sam Gilliam, friend of the gallery. Uh, this piece is from 1997. And uh, it's interesting that T you mentioned about how the color yellow is associated with confidence and particularly someone who maybe doesn't always go along with everybody else and has a strong will. So Sam Gilliam definitely has a very strong will. Um, he, his artwork is known for its fundamental disregard for the boundaries that have traditionally separated painting, sculpture, and architecture. So it's all these things kind of mixed up into one and he plays with this on a regular basis in his artwork. Um, he lives in Washington, DC, and he has been a major artist uh, since 1968. And uh, around that time was when he stopped using wooden stretchers to support his paintings. Um, so he, he started to just paint directly onto the canvas and hang it like drapery 
um, in a gallery or in his space. Um, and we actually have a couple of his drapery paintings in our uh, collection. But he um, creates work that is in a variety of styles that has been going in and out of different phases since the 60s. Um, but in this particular instance, in the early 90s, he adopted birch plywood as a support surface. So birch plywood, if you've ever seen it, is very pale. It has a very um, pale, like light gray, white color to it. And um, in this way, he pours paint onto these pieces of plywood that he builds up from the surface. So in that way, he's kind of playing with the architecture of wood um, and its, its relief properties. So the surface of this piece, Fishing Well, is poured acrylic paint. And so there's this um, suggestion of depth from the colors. He, he pours different colors of acrylic paint with different um, textures in it. And so you really feel the way that he pushes and pulls this paint across the surface to give a sense of, of texture, maybe some images kind of derived from that and the suggestion of depth. Um, it's a very cool piece and it has kind of a glossy surface as well. That's really interesting about Sam Gilliam's pl uh, plywood pieces, but um, yeah, it has a, a soothing quality to it considering that it's so predominantly yellow. Um, Lauren, have you touched this piece? I have touched this piece because I'm allowed to touch this piece. Can you tell us what it feels like? Um, it's cool. It's smooth. Hmm. And um, it uh, has like a plasticky quality to it. Now, as someone who works in curatorial, I'm going to tell you, and I'm going to tell all of our listeners right now here today, that you are not allowed to touch the artwork. <laughs> <laughs> only, only professionals are allowed to touch the artwork. In fact, um, our, uh, our collections manager, our registrar, uh, Courtney, might be a little mad at me that I actually touched it without a glove on. <laughs> i tell her, shh. You know, we're friend, all friends here. Shh, don't talk. I'll delete it from the recording. Okay. Um, thanks. <laughs> can you tell us how large the piece is? Is this like ten inches or three feet? Uh, this piece is about, I would say, five or six feet high by about four feet wide, um, and uh, it has this this like um, that more yellow with the red in it. That piece that you see to the right um, is actually um, built up onto it. So it's kind of a three, it, it's almost a three-dimensional quality to the, to the piece as well. Great. Please. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, great question, Nancy. Um, yeah. One thing I love about Sam Gilliam is how Lauren, as you said, he like pushes the limits on what a painting is. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a couple of works by Sam Gilliam in our collection. One of my favorites is he has two of these draped pieces of fabric um, and last year for Halloween, one of my girlfriends wanted to dress up as one of his draped works of fabric. And she thought like, oh, I'll just grab some linen and I'll just paint it and it'll be really easy. It'll look just like a Sam Gilliam piece. Um, mm -hmm. And we learned very quickly that there is more to his art than just like randomly splashing paint around. Exactly. Um, also, also our registrar, the lovely Courtney DiMartino, who's not here, let me touch the draped fabric piece. Oh, yeah, it was like my favorite day at work because I really like touching things and working in an art museum, um, you can't. And it was really interesting because when you see the piece, it looks like silk. I feel like it hangs like silk. So yes. I was expecting it to have like a really soft, supple, delicate feel that I would have wanted to like rub against my face, which I obviously didn't. Um, but instead it felt like a piece of like used dryer sheet. It was like, it was rough. It was weird. Yeah, it's um, it's a, a polyethylene fabric that he uses. It's, it's so that the the paint absorbs quickly into it. It's kind of like Tyvek. It's uh, it's soft but also has like a stiffness. It's not yeah, it's not um, pleasant to touch. No, I didn't want to rub my face. Not that I would rub my face in a work of art, but anyway, we're just gonna move along to the next piece before we get fired. <laughs> <laughs> Yay, beautiful green. Love green, that's why I'm wearing green. Interestingly, the human eye can recognize the mo most amount of hues of the color green, the most variation in the color, color green. So that brings us to our heart chakra. So our heart chakra, located at the heart, is associated with the air element, the element of air. And it's also, of course, we know associated with love and relationships. 
And the breath that we have paired today with the heart chakra is the Ujjayi breath. Ujjayi breath is a common breath. If you were taking a yoga class, they would encourage you to use this Ujjayi breath, which is an open throat breathing technique. And it also is called the victorious breath. And it brings about feelings of, of freedom and elation. So we're gonna practice this breath. And the way we practice this is by keeping the lips closed and opening the back of the throat. So as you inhale, think about sending the breath to the back of the throat. And if you're having trouble opening the back of your throat, think about the sound that you might make trying to fog a mirror. So if you were to put your hand in front of your face and pretend that's a mirror, and then you make the ha, ha, ha sound, and then close your lips and take an inhale, you still want to create that same feeling, that openness in the back of the throat. As you breathe in and out with this open throat, it's quite audible. It either sounds like a hairdryer or it sounds like uh, I've been told the Darth Vader breath. So for all our Star Wars fans out there, this one's for you, the Darth Vader breath. So we're going to close our lips. We're going to breathe in and out again for three cycles. So a nice deep inhale, opening the back of the throat, and then a nice full exhale. Again, out through the nostrils and in through the nostrils. And if at any time you feel like you can't get a full breath in, then you can go ahead and open the mouth. So when you're ready, lips are closed, opening the back of the throat as you inhale and send that back behind. And again, inhaling. Kind of sounds like we're snoring. One more, inhale. And you can continue with your victorious breath. And we're going to take in some more about this beautiful green piece of artwork. I certainly think it's beautiful. It's not everyone's favorite, um, but I really love it. I mean, obviously green is my favorite color, but uh, this piece is called Seer and it's by Helen Frankenthaler. It's from 1980. Um, Helen Frankenthaler actually died fairly recently. She died in 2011 and she was a major American painter. And she had a very long career throughout the 20th century. And she experimented with um, new techniques that included pouring oil paint thinned with turpentine directly onto these large pieces of unprimed canvas. And so that allowed the paint to kind of saturate the cloth and it created these loose and fluid fields of color. And you'll be reminded of uh, the Sam Gilliam piece from before that it's this idea of pouring paint onto the canvas and an emphasis on color. So this particular emphasis on color is something that the second generation of abstract artists um, called the color field. So they were known as color field painters. And other color field painters included Morris Lewis uh, and Kenneth Noland. And um, Helen Frankenthaler was one of the few women who was uh, very um, prolific and very successful as a color field painter. So her philosophy was basically, there are no rules. You let the picture lead where, where it must go. So she had a very um, emotional and um, kind of philosophical uh, approach to painting. Um, this is not everyone's favorite. Um, it has been, um, I don't know, derided in the past <laughs> from local art historians who shall remain nameless, but I really like it, although someone did say that it reminded them a lot of the city garbage cans color, the exact hue of a city garbage can. So, which um, is really fascinating, Lauren, because yeah. um, when I put this into PowerPoint, you know, like Google has that identifier when you hover over an image, and the yeah. Google identifier was literally trash can. <laughs> so, so, no, even Google is is <laughs> about this piece. I don't know. I like it. I think it's. Thing. I think it, it deserves love just as much as everything else. Um, Lauren, walk us through. So abstract expressionism came about um, kind of like in reaction to World War II, like at the end of World War II, the world was in shambles and people were looking to the art world for something new and fun and different. And that's kind of how abstract expressionism came to be. But how did it, like, was it popular when it first started? How, because how do you go from you know, painters like Bouguereau who are like hyper-realistic 
mm -hmm. um, to works of art that Google deems trash. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, what was good. the reaction? Yeah, that's a good question. So, I mean, um, these these artists, these post-war artists, um, were definitely uh, all about rejecting figural, figurative art, right? This was their grandparents' art. They didn't want to do that anymore. The war had changed them deeply and they wanted to strike out on their own and create artwork that was, that really embraced the emotion and philosophy of art and what an artist can do with paint and a canvas to express themselves. Um, this, you know, much like anything, people hate change uh, and the art world especially, oh my goodness. So of course, like abstract expressionism, post-war people hated it. I could do that, my, you know, my three-year-old could do it, that kind of thing. Um, but nevertheless, it really made a huge impact. And so we see that even today. Abstract expressionism is a legitimate and very wide ranging form of artwork right now. And so it's this idea of like kinetic expression, right? You're, you're trying to express movement and, um, and kind of like your inner turmoil or joy or calm or whatever through color and shape as opposed to um, direct expressions of like human figures. Um, I mean, it's, it's beautiful. It's a new way of artwork, right? Like if we were just doing to continue to keep like drawing people on and on and on, it gets boring after a while, right? Like it's, you know, variety is the spice of life. So I, I'm a big fan of, of abstract expressionism just as much as figurative art, you know, I love all my children. <laughs> thanks Lauren um and thanks T for the Darth Vader breath it's nice I feel like that's the breath I use when I'm irritated with my husband so it's nice to know that I'm like calming myself <laughs> while um you know passive aggressively cursing his name moving along to blue all right blue beautiful blue brings us up to our throat chakra so this is found at the base of the throat the fifth chakra, the throat chakra, is associated with the space element. It's also associated with self-expression and communication. So the breath that we're going to use to coincide with this chakra is called the shitali breath. And shitali breath, shitali is a snake in Sanskrit, like an Indian snake. And the type of uh, breath that we're going to use for this one is a mouth breathing technique. And we're actually going to stick, stick our tongue out and curl our tongue around. So curl the edges of the tongue. Now I realize probably half of the folks joining us will be able to do that and half will not be able to do that. So you can blame genetics. It's fine. If you can't curl your tongue, you can just simply uh, make a circle with your lips like you're about to sip out of a straw and that will bring about the same effect. So by cooling, I mean that this breath, it's, um, it's not energizing like our breath of fire, it's cooling and it actually cools the frontal lobe of our brains. And cooling the frontal lobe of our brains can help uh, calm us down and take out uh, feelings of aggression. Um, so you can practice by sticking your tongue out and curling it or make that cir circular uh, position with your lips like you're about to sip out of a straw and both the inhalation and the exhalation is performed that way. So again, we're gonna do three cycles, uh, three full breaths. So I'll make that position with my tongue now and you can join me or just make that other position with your mouth. So take a nice inhale first through the nostrils and you're gonna exhale it out through the tongue. And you can re-moisten your tongue now. Just let your hands rest gently in your lap. And we'll continue to hear more about this beautiful piece of blue glass artwork. So uh, this piece is called Blue Prism Painting One from 2014. And this is by an artist named Josiah McElhenney. Uh, Josiah McElhenney is a master glass blower, and um, his artwork explores specific moments in the history of glass and 20th century modernism. So this, as you can see with these, these vases in this piece, it, it has a very, you know, mid-century modern kind of quality to it. 
Um, his art also kind of is inspired by optimism for the future. So there's kind of a, a mid-century futurism to it as well. Um, and his, also his mirrors and highly reflective surfaces um, speak to the modern aspirations of the past. And it invites viewers into this, this kind of glassy world of perfection. So um, in this image that you see right here, we actually had to Photoshop it a little bit because it is um, reflective on the back. Uh, so it's the idea of that you can kind of immerse yourself in the space, much like the Ed Reinhardt piece. And in fact, this piece is, um, uh, Josiah McElhenney was um, thinking of Ed Reinhardt when creating these pieces, right? So it's this idea of like being able to enter the space of the artwork and also see yourself in the background of it. Um, we had to Photoshop it because um, our photographer, Andy Olenek, um, you could see all of him in it. And that's kind of distracting. Um, so uh, this piece, as I mentioned before, it was inspired by Ad Reinhardt, specifically his blue paintings. And again, Reinhardt sought to make these pure paintings that rejected imagery and emotion and the world outside of their frames. So again, it's this kind of contemplative, um, kind of meditative entrance into the space of the artwork and allowing yourself to be kind of surrounded by it. Um, and I just, I really love this piece. It hangs in the galleries now. You can go visit it right now. Um, well, not right now, but today, earlier today or tomorrow. Uh, and I really like it because as I'm walking through the galleries, I can like check my look uh, because the glass behind this blue and blue is very flattering to the human skin. It's just, you look incredible in this piece. So I highly recommend you go and check yourself out. You know. Right. I feel like this piece is like the OG Instagram filter because that blue glass just makes your skin, you know. It look, it's so, it's like, it's very evening, like blue and pink light as well. Pink light is also something that makes you look just like glowy and perfect and beautiful. Yeah, it's great. Um, I just have to quickly say that if you did want to go check this piece out, the museum is open until 9 p.m. tonight. So oh. after, <laughs> so after the detour, you yeah, can thank you. Yes, <laughs> hop on over. Um, yes. So one thing, so this, I really like blue, and I like how um, this piece reminds me of like a a sale at Target. Like, which vase is the vase for you? Because there's so many different options. Um, but T, I was wondering. So I was doing some research on color psychology and blue is really calming, it's peaceful, it's also the best for creativity and productivity. And I feel like that last breath that we took, um, to me, it felt like the most tranquil breath that we've taken so far. And I just wonder if you know, like, was the chakra color chart created after the breaths? Like what inspired what? Because I feel like you know, yellow is like an energetic color. And I feel like that breath was really energetic. So like, how, how did that come to be? Yeah, so the chakras came first, or the chakras already, you know, exist in our bodies or exist uh, as an energy channel. And the breath, there's so, there's so many breath, uh, different types of breath that we can take. And in uh, the yoga world, it's called pranayama. So prana, uh, meaning uh, life force or life force breath, life force energy. So there's various breaths that we can use for either calming or grounding or balancing. So that happened to be the one that I chose to pair with this. So, so I think your chicken and egg question, the chakras came first, the breath is somewhat that came after. Um, thanks so much, Dee. And then, sorry, I just have another question that just came to me. How like, how did the chakras even come to be? Was it just like a group of people sitting around being like, hey, you know what helps me de-stress when I breathe like this? Like, how did that, because it's been around for thousands of years. Yeah, so for over 4,000 years ago, this was something that was practiced by, you know, ancient yogis and people that understood the body just in a different way before there was modern medicine, before there was Western medicine. Um, they understood energy channels and by, manipulating the breath in such a way that you could um, either increase your energy or calm yourself down. So, so certainly sitting around a fire 4,000 years ago, understanding that, you know, by manipulating different parts of these centers that we can make wonderful thing happen, wonderful things happen with the body. Thanks so much. That's, I just can't imagine being like, 
wait, no, you have to blow out slowly seven times, not three times. <laughs> it was, this has been a fun conversation. Um, okay, moving along to the next color, purple. Yes, so purple brings us to our brow chakra. So between the eyebrows, just a little higher on the forehead, uh, this is considered our sixth chakra. It's known as the seer, the, and it also encompasses all of the elements. So we've got earth, we've got water, fire, air, space. It encompasses all of these elements. And it's tied into our intuition. You may have heard that area referred to as the third eye. It's tied into our intuition and our ability to see things, <clears throat> but not with our physical eyes, but see things internally. So the breath that we're gonna perform pairing with our brow chakra is the Brahmari breath. So Brahmari is another calming breath. Brahmari with a B happens to be named after an Indian bee, like a bumblebee. And it's got a buzzing sound associated with it. So I'll demonstrate it and then we can perform it together. Um, if you are seated and you're able to pull your knees up around you, it's very comfortable and convenient to rest your elbows on your knees. It's okay if you're not uh, able to pull your knees up, but it's just a nice convenience to set your elbows right on your knees because we will be applying our hands to our face. So this one is kind of a internal awareness. It's um, sensory deprivation, if you will. So we don't want to see with this one, we wanna cover our eyes. We're also gonna take our thumbs and actually plug our ears. So don't do it yet, but we're gonna take a nice inhale through the nostrils. And then as we exhale, we're gonna make a humming sound. And by humming, it creates this internal phonics. So this internal vibration that we can feel from the inside out. It also makes an auditory uh, sound, but we're concerned with the internal vibration that it creates. So I'll demonstrate one and then we'll do uh, three together. So I'm gonna take an inhale through my nostrils, cover my eyes and ears, and then let it out with an exhale as I hum. Mm -hmm. So if you wanna try that one, we'll do three cycles. So again, inhaling through the nostrils, you're gonna hum as you exhale, and then you'll take another breath through the nostrils and then hum it out. So you're taking your thumbs, and pressing on that little piece of cartilage. It's called the tragus. And you can plug your ears while you do this one. So inhale, exhale it out with a hum. Once you're done with your third, you can just let your hands rest gently in your lap and just feel the effects of that nice internal vibration that you've created. Ah, and then we'll stare into this beautiful purple painting. Um, so this painting might be familiar to those of you who have been to the gallery in the past couple of years. Um, this was a central part of our Monet exhibit that we had a couple of years ago. Um, this is Claude Monet's Waterloo Bridge Failed Sun from 1903. And um, Monet is someone who was obsessed with light and weather. So he especially loved London for its fog. And he went and visited London a couple of times, but during his 1901 visit to the city, he really wanted to capture this kind of evanescent effect of its misty climate in a series of views of Waterloo Bridge, which you see here, under all sorts of varying conditions, right? So every time the light and the weather shifted, he would either start a new canvas or he would return to the one that actually recorded that particular atmosphere. So you can imagine him on like his balcony at his hotel and he has like seven different paintings and one is like fog and one is rain and one is sun and one is, you know, a sunset or whatever. And he keeps like running back and forth to each one of these things to kind of make sure that he can capture exactly what he wants to capture. 
Um, the other thing that's very interesting about this is that he never completed these paintings in London specifically. So he perfected them in his studio in France over the course of the following three years. So you can say that this painting records not only the artist's immediate response to the scene, but also his memory of it. And the interesting thing about memory is that um, neurologists have studied memory and uh, what happens when you remember a memory is that you basically overwrite that memory. So every time you remember a memory, you are remembering it differently than how it happened or how you remembered it the previous time. So this painting not only is uh, showing the verisimilitude of what the, the day looked like that exact day, but also how Monet remembered that day, which might be different from how it actually was, if that makes any sense. Um, thank you, Lauren. I, so you said that Monet was obsessed with color. Um, I recently read that he was so obsessed with color and like capturing color that he um, painted his wife after she passed away. Um, he painted her corpse in various stages of decay. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if you can confirm that weird piece of knowledge. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yep. Kyle, ew, for sure. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, he did. And in fact, uh, there's some evidence of he, he wrote to a friend um, after his wife died and he said something like, I'm really embarrassed or I'm, I feel terrible for doing this, but I have to paint her. Like the colors in her face and the colors that it's happening on her skin. I feel like I have to capture that. Um, and I know that it's morbid, but I think he was, he was kind of writing to his friend to get some validation somehow. And I, <laughs> I don't know if sorry. Had, like, yeah, his friend's like reaction to that, like Claude, maybe put the paint down and, you know, walk or something. Yeah. Um, yeah. He definitely, uh, he was somebody who needed to capture what was in front of him all the time, regardless. Yikes. I wonder, I just wonder like how long he waited to make her funeral arrangements, you know, if like, <laughs> one more week. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, pretty, pretty weird stuff. Um, oh, Victoria, what museum has those? That's a really great question. I don't know, but I will find out and then um, I'll send everyone an email <laughs> with the recording of this and also um, with what I find about his paintings of his dead wife. I, I do know that um, his home in Giverny has a very large collection of his personal papers and, and personal artwork. So I would imagine that it's probably there. Nice, yeah, yikes. Um, T, that breath was my favorite so far. I love it because, so first of all, it reminds me of like every time I'm in a meeting with Jonathan Binstock, our director, and he like assigns me a task, like, no, <laughs> like, you can't see, you can't hear, you're not doing it. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, but also I like that you, it's like, it's so self-soothing because you can hear only your voice and like the vibrations of your body and then how, you know, you're like blocking out all of the sensory images. Yeah, that was lovely. Thank you. Nice. Yes. Nice. Um, okay. Yeah. The vibrations on the body all over Andy. It's true. It was, yeah, I'm probably going to like, um, fall asleep to that tonight. Nice. Um, Okay, moving on to our last color, white. Oh, okay. White can be seen in our chakra system just above the crown of the head. It's considered the crown chakra, but just above the crown of the head. So it's often associated with a pure crystal color, crystal white but also hints of violet can be found at this chakra. Uh, this one is associated with our connection to the divine and our true nature and where that resides. And also it's considered the crown which lies above the head is transcending one's ego. If you think about picturing that, it's transcending the ego, it's the highest level in the chakra system that you can, you can reach. It's associated with enlightenment, uh, an attainment of this uh, piece. So in order to um, pair this crown chakra, I've chosen the uh, Kumbhaka breath. So Kumbhaka, not Chewbacca, but Kumbhaka with a K. Lots of Star Wars references tonight. So I hope we have some fans in the crowd. 
Uh, so the Chewbacca breath, what this breath is, is it's about breath retention. So it's about holding the breath. And we're gonna cycle through this and we're gonna hold the breath in a series of fives. So we know that right now on average, our, we take a breath every three seconds and our breath is somewhat hurried and it's somewhat shallow. So this breath uh, forces the inhalation and the exhalation to elongate to five seconds. And it also allows us to hold the breath because a lot of the um, ancient research that we know suggests that it's not so much what the inhalation can give us and what the exhalation can give us, but it's actually the space we create in between each breath that provides us with that most uh, benefit. So um, once again, if you feel uh, dizzy at all, I don't recommend this one, um, but certainly try it. Uh, on your own time. If you find that five seconds, a five second hold is too long for you or too much, you can just make it three seconds. So we're gonna cycle through three times. First, we're gonna start by inhaling through the nostrils. You're gonna hold that breath for five seconds and then you're gonna exhale it out for five seconds. And I'm gonna count off with my fingers so you can um, simply watch so you know when to inhale, when to exhale, and when to hold the breath and whatnot. So we're gonna to inhale to a count of five, hold the breath for a count of five, exhale to a count of five, do that a total of three times. So this is called the kumbhaka or breath retention. So when you're ready, all through the nostrils, we're gonna inhale, two, three, four, five, hold that breath, two, three, four, Five, exhale through the nostrils. Two, three, four, five. Hold that breath out. Two, three, four, five. Inhale through the nostrils. Two, three, four, five. Hold that breath for five. In, hold that breath. Inhale. Two, three, four, five. And exhale it out. Two, three, four. Five, last cycle. Inhale, two, three, four, five. Hold that breath, two, three, four, five. Exhale it out, two, three, four, five. Let that breath return to normal. So we're gonna hear more about this crown chakra piece of artwork this white, beautiful piece we have in front of us. Um, so this piece is a sculpture. It's uh, known as Dawn's Landscape 40 by Louise Nevelson. It's from 1975. So the color white, as you mentioned, T, is transcending of the ego. While um, And while the yellow piece with Sam Gilliam really connected on a major way, um, Louise Nevelson and transcending the ego doesn't really go together. Uh, Louise Nevelson was a ferocious, tough, badass lady who did what she wanted and everybody get out of her way. So she was um, just the most forceful, the most difficult. She kind of kicked in the door for artwork for herself. Um, she was uh, a sculptor, which was um, something that, especially in the mid 20th century was relegated to like a masculine art form. Um, but she was making these monumental single color monochromatic wooden sculptures while a lot of uh, her, counter her male counterparts were working in metal. Um, so these object sculptures, she also would use found objects. So she would walk through the streets of New York City where she was living and pick up garbage. <laughs> she would pick up um, pieces of um, balusters or chair legs or, or paint handles. And she would make these pieces. And this piece in particular is known as a wall, one of her walls. Um, and this is uh, a collage driven relief, um, which consists of multiple boxes and compartments that hold abstract shapes in these found objects as mentioned before. I think that they look a little bit like, um, almost like a, 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 like a tenement house kind of thing. It has this kind of like, um, container box kind of quality to them. 
Um, and she described these immersive sculptures as environments. So that kind of goes off of that. Um, so she said uh, she went through a couple of phases of color in her, um, she went through a black period, she went to, through a gold period, and she also went through a white period where she was painting everything all white. And um, she said at one point that white was the color that summoned the early morning and emotional promise. And I just really like this piece. Um, her artworks, this one is kind of a, a smaller one. Um, I've seen much, much larger ones just kind of like completely like fills an entire wall, like, you know, 15 or 20 feet wide and like 15 feet high. This one's a, bit, a little bit smaller. It's probably five by five, not even, maybe four by four. Um, but it's really great. It's very, um, again, I mean, I keep saying this word immersive, but it is very immersive. Like you get up close to it and you can see all of these different um, components that she found and painted white so that it kind of gives a, um, a uniformity, but also kind of a, a, you can really see like the different kind of elements to it. Yeah, um, actually our chat is, yeah, people, yeah, um, Kyle says it looks like an MC Escher piece. Emma says it looks like ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics. Andy mm -hmm. says it's focused, but very busy. Uh, yeah, there is so much texture. Have you touched this piece? I have not touched this piece. Oh man, what do you think it feels <laughs> because like? Because it's an older piece and because there are so many small elements to it, um, we try not to, you know, rattle it around too much. <laughs> yeah, it almost <laughs> reminds me of, um, wait, and I don't want to like offend anyone, but it almost reminds me of, do you remember like making those mouse traps when you were in school with like the cardboard and you like roll, that's kind of, yes, yes thank Kyle you. Thanks yes. for validating Kyle, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's kind of the, I mean, it's, it's fun, right? It has like a, a playful quality to it as well. Mm -hmm. like, I do know that the Toledo Museum of Art has a purple one and it, the tits. it's a great piece. Yeah. <laughs> Not that ours um, isn't, but it's great. Right. Yeah. Purple is always fun. Um, T, that last breath that we did with the holding for five seconds and breathing for five seconds, um, I'm wondering if you know, like, what does that do for lung health? Because I feel like I need an inhaler. <laughs> <laughs> so interestingly, um, it, it can actually uh, train your diaphragm to take in more breath. So when we hold our breath, whether it's on the inhalation or the exhalation, it's actually training your diaphragm. Our diaphragm is a muscle in shallow breathers or people with uh, asthma um, are, are very uh, shallow breathers and they really only exercise the upper part of their chest, whereas the retention part really draws it down in the diaphragm and it, it forces that muscle to work because it's, it needs to be exercised. So it's, it's strengthening, it's strengthening your diaphragm. Right. Yeah. I felt like, yeah, like, you know, like when you go running and you can't breathe, but like, you know, it's good for you. Yeah, yes. exactly. Um, so those are all of our works of art and we actually created this um, chakra chart for you with the colors and um, the symbols and we connected it to our works of art. Um, so I will be emailing this to you also uh, with the recording, probably like within a week or so, because um, what is time, you know, um, you know, I've got to get the recording up on the website, all those things. Um, we are a little over time, but does anyone have any um, questions that they want to ask for T? Oh, I do. If there's, does T have anything that she recommends that we maybe read or look at to learn Ooh. more about this? And also, I think the the energy thing is upside down. Wait, like, oh, is it coming across upside down for for everyone? The crown oh, the is red, the bottom, red's on the bottom. The red needs to be on the bottom. Oh, okay. That Got it. Mm -hmm. Yes, we will. I'll, I'll fix that. Thank you so much. <laughs> yes, great question. And I do happen to have um, a book that I'm currently reading and I'm about halfway through and it's so good. I will recommend it to our audience since we are talking about breath. Um, this book is called Breath. And it's actually called uh, The New Science of a Lost Arts by James Nestor. And for those of you who are interested in learning more about um, specifically the, uh, the function of the diaphragm, uh, how you can become a better breather, again, uh, 
respiration is restoration. So you want to think of uh, how you can be more efficient in your breath. So this happens to be a, a good book that I picked up that I think I really appreciate the explanation. It's both like modern science combined with 4,000 years of, you know, yogic wisdom and uh, it pulls in different aspects from our, you know, evolutionary traits to, you know, modern day uh, CPAP machines, you know, it talks about how we can be become better breathers and enhance our whole our whole world as a result of it. Um, very nice. Thanks, T. And actually, wait, we have some questions. Oops, sorry about the chart. It's my fault um, because there were two and I naturally uploaded the wrong one. But I'm taking a deep breath to help me relax. Um, T, if you did the did 10 for the last breath, if you did 10 seconds in and out with a five second hold, is that okay or not okay? Yeah, so the longer that you're able to use that muscle, the longer that you're able to uh, either on the inhalation or exhalation, the more space that you're creating. So um, yogis have been known to perform that uh, breath for up to 30 seconds. So you're always strengthening that muscle. Like I said, if on average, just our natural breath is every three seconds, anything longer than that, you're creating more space and more strength in your diaphragm than you would have if you didn't if you didn't perform that hold. So as long as you're not getting lightheaded and you don't have pre-existing conditions, of course, uh, certainly anything that you can do to 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 force that um, inhalation and exhalation, and it should be fairly smooth. So just because you can hold your breath for that long or you can inhale or exhale for that long, um, try to make your transitions as smooth as possible. So it's not like a like a choppy like a choppy kind of jump start to your system. It really should, one should flow into the next. And then that, that really speaks to how much control you have through the chest and through the diaphragm. If you can flow seamlessly and effortlessly from one hold to the inhalation and the exhalation. So good, yes, practice, practice, practice. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, T. Thank you so much, Lauren. Um, and thank you to everyone who came, all of the wonderful conversations and the great questions. Um, like I said, I'll email you within a week or so um, with the recording of the detour, James Nestor's book, Breathe, Breath, Breathe, or Breath. 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 <laughs> breath um and some other resources for you uh so thanks everyone thanks for coming enjoy your thursday night the museum is open for two more hours if you're around yeah. there <laughs> okay enjoy your right. night bye thank you Jessica. Bye. Thank, thank you all thank you